Buenas tardes a todos. ¿Cómo, les... ¿Cómo están? Quiero primeramente oh. darle las gracias por asistir. Muchísimas gracias por su paciencia. Espero que hayan disfrutado una rica comida. Y bienvenidos a The Rodas uh, Rufus Hot. Hoy vamos a tener nuestro último encuentro del año, pero no es el último porque vamos a tener muchos más. ¿Listo? Mi nombre es Sandra Peñuela, voy a estar presentando en español y Carly va a estar presentando en inglés. Okay, thank you all for coming. Thank you for your patience. Um, hope that you all have enjoyed our food that we've had here for you. Um, this is going to be our last presentation of the year, but we're going to keep going um, and we're going to have many more to come. Um, this is the presentation of poetry for Rufus Hut, and I'm going to be the presenter in English. This is Sandra, and she's going to be presenting in Spanish. Uh, vamos a tener um, cuatro, cuatro ruedas, cuatro momentos donde vamos a estar presentando y leyendo nuestros poemas y también eh, historias cortas. Entonces nos vamos a dividir de la... Bueno, eh, en la medida en que nos vamos presentando, entonces les voy dando los nombres. Nuestro primer grupo va a ser Sandra Milena Peñuela, su servidora, Carly Eman, eh, a Alejandro Gómez de Colombia, Ariela Parisia, perdón, eh, y Caitlin Buder de Estados Unidos. ¿Listo? Ok, so we're going to do this, we're going to have different rounds for um, the presenters. Of poetry, we're going to start with group one, and Sandra um, is going to start, she's from Colombia, my name is Carly Henman, um, I'm from Ohio, and then we have Alejandro Gomez, who's going to present, he's from Colombia, um, Caitlin Boer from the U.S. as well. So, podemos darle la bienvenida a nuestros presentadores. I kind of repeat the first half, so, um, so I'm going to go ahead and start that. So. Mi amor, I found a love. A type of love that people wait their whole lives for. The type of love that keeps you laughing up at night late with friends. Who never makes you feel like you must sacrifice a part of yourself. Mi morenito, I found a love. A true, enduring love. The type of love that the sacred ones don't expect me. Who never keeps track of any wrongs that I do. A forgiving love. Mi precioso. I found a love, a peaceful love, the type of love that radiates happiness, the type that can't be captured in a photo, who makes you laugh, who makes you laugh the laugh that resounds from the pit of your stomach. Mi bebé, encontré un amor, un amor sencillo, el tipo de amor que no me, do, que no me domestica. Cuando escucho sus promesas, no me agarran por el cuello ni me asfixian. Mi hermoso, mi chico hermoso, encontré un amor, un amor maravilloso, el tipo de amor que me deja sentir lo que quiera. Cuando necesito llorar, está allá para enredarme con sus palabras inspiradoras. Mi flaco, encontré un amor, un amor paciente, el tipo de amor que que en mis noches aisladas está aquí para limpiar mi cara de las lágrimas dolorosas. Cuando tus palabras me apuñalaron el cuerpo y, el cuerpo y el cuerpo escupió sangre, estaba allí cosiendo las heridas. Mi hermoso tomador, encontré un amor. No puedo quedarme, no puedo contestarte porque no puedo engañarte. No me puedo perder más. No te podía amar porque no me dejabas pensar. Mi conquistador, usted ha hecho, usted ha hecho lo que el león hizo a su país. Usted me ha ganado y me ha devorado, pero he superado lo que me ha pasado. Usted ganó las contiendas, pero yo firmé la constitución de mi propia independencia. Encontré un amor que me, que me ha puesto en libertad. ¿Cómo se llama? Amor propio. is the last one where basically just says that um, I was in a bad relationship and it's about the breakup of that relationship and it was saying that I um, he may have won the fight and everything but I in the end I signed my own um, declaration of independence basically um, and then I have another one this one's all in English and I wrote it because I, w I was just kind of tired 
of hearing about how people need to love everybody and accept everybody, but I just don't see it. Um, so I wrote about that. <laughs> that was my inspiration. Um, so I have so much left to give. So why not give it to strangers who search every day for a reason to live, as if their existence was useless? And life acts like a lion, and it takes its claws from behind and surprises its prey, ruthless. I have so much left to give, so why not give it to the old friend that I cut off because of an inability to forgive during a time that I had no emotions. And she called me the other day crying because she said it would be easier not to live and to take the Kool-Aid potion. I have so much left to give, so why not give it to he who works hard for who works hard for the country who, where he lives? But that same but that same sorry. But that same nation rejects him and tells him to learn the language that they speak, or they will place him in alienation. Said by the same man who goes to church every Sunday, and hopes that even though he spits those words out of his mouth, as long as he proclaims the love of Jesus, he'll make it through his pearly white gates someday. I have so much love to give, so why not give it to the girl who is in the corner crying? Because she testified in court that she said no, but no must mean yes, so everyone says that she's lying. They tell her to cover up and to watch what she wears, but her sweatpants and her sweatshirt didn't stop her rapist, and now she's surrounded by people, but she still feels obligated to shoot her flares. Everyone preaches love like neighbor, but how about my friend who's a guy but he feels like a woman? Can you imagine waking up every morning in disgust and avoid looking in the mirror, thinking, what did I do to deserve this omen? He feels more like an outcast than Tom Hanks and Wilson, all because his doctors refer him to another doctor, who refers him to another doctor just to get his estrogen filled in. His life is in danger, all because he wants to be a woman? I made the subtitles of this video. I want to see that you can read the subtitles. The video is in Spanish, but the subtitles are in English. And I want to show you this, because this person here is my cousin. His name is Alvaro Andres Cernagones and it is a two minute video and I want you to know him and then I'm going to read for you La soledad es algo que ningún ser humano tiene no todo lo tiene es un ego muy duro que va en el alma y el alma llora ríe Hay locos que locos son, hay locos que nacen locos, hay locos por la miseria y hay locos por el amor, hay locos que si ser locos vuelven a locos a los que locos no son, y hay locos que si ser locos pagan la vida feliz. Madre me la mata ahora, se ven a salud. Y matarán para ir mañana o para la mañana, pero voy tranquilo. Y voy al lado de ella. Tengo con ella en la mano siempre. Así va a ser. Me tocó la prosa. Me tocó la prosa en esta vida. Los quiero mucho. Mis grandes amigos se han manejado muy bien y han sido mis grandes amigos. Bueno, todas que son de buena existencia, todas que son de fuego las estrellas, todas que al sol movimiento falta, todas de lo cierto, pero de mi amor nunca doy las ansias. Uh, as I told you, his name is Alvaro Andres Herna Gomez, and his nickname, his nickname is uh, Pavilo. Um, uh, I need to explain what Pavilo is. A Pavilo is uh, the wick of the candle, which is in fire. And we say prendido in Spanish, in fire, prendido. And prendido in Colombian Spanish is also drunk. So my cousin loved to drink a lot. Um, I'm going to read. Loneliness is something that does not belong to everyone. Loneliness is hard. Loneliness belongs to the soul. And when the soul cries, she also laughs. Loneliness makes you bored. Loneliness makes you become crazy. Loneliness makes you miserable. Loneliness makes you fall in love. 
Loneliness makes you become crazy, even though you are not actually crazy. Loneliness needs souls, the lonely souls that despite their loneliness, they are happy anyway. I had a cousin I loved a lot. His mom, my aunt, was killed in our town. My cousin is also dead. He was 43. He knew he was going to die. He was so calm. He's going to be next to my aunt. He has always been next to her. She has always taken his hand, my cousin's hand. My cousin loved prose. Prose was his life. My, my cousin sometimes repeated these lines from Shakespeare. Doubt thou the stars are fire. Doubt that the sun doth move. Doubt truth to be a liar. But never doubt I love. My cousin told me that he was going to be the 13th cursed poet. His mom, my aunt, was the mayor of our town. She was killed because she was going to be robbed. We don't know the reason. We do know that the world is full of bad people. His dad was killed by a truck. My cousin lost his family when he was 16. How can one not become crazy if one loses what is the most precious in life? My cousin died on December the 24th, 2015, three months after the death of my dad. My cousin received his Christmas gift. He wanted to die. He told me that. Everyone remembers him. Everyone laughs with him. Everyone smiles when they go to the, their thoughts about him. Everyone accompanied his lifeless body. We walked with his body on the streets, the same streets he would walk when he was alive. And we listened to the songs he loved and we love, Volver by Carlos Gardel, which says, I guess the flickering on the lights that Sorry, I guess the flickering of the lights that in the distance mark my return. They are the same that lit with their pale reflections the powers of pain. And although I did not want to the return, we always return to the first love. The old street where an echo said, yours is your life, yours is your love, under the mocking look of the stars, the apathetically see me coming back today. In the church, we were to receive the blessing. The blessing. We went to the cemetery, Santa Ana. Not before playing his favorite songs again, we played La Milonga Celestial. That, uh, those were my first poem, and now I'm going to read the second one in Spanish again. Eso de perder. Amarte duele. Desearte. Esperarte duele. Pensarte. Sentirte duele, añorarte, pero perderte, pero perderte, eso es silencio, silencio puro. So now the, the English version, the translation is, uh, the name is losing you. Loving you hurts, desiring you, awaiting you hurts, thinking of you, feeling you hurts, longing for you, but losing you, losing you, that is pure silence. Thank you. And this is my third poem, which is the last one. Um, the name is A Contramar Against the Sea. Um, Quiero terminarme con el dolor de tu deserción, aunque no quisiera morirlo, por esa eternidad entreverada que se arrastra en las aguas turbias de tu pobre atrevimiento. And then in English will be, against the sea, in the pain of you living, I want to end myself, but for that disorderly eternity, I wouldn't like to die, that which grovels in the choppy waters of your insolence. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Ana Maria Rodriguez. I'm 
my name's Caitlin. Um, I'll be reading two poems that were both written in Spanish first, and um, the first one is a sonnet, and the second poem would be considered more of a free verse. La Tranquilidad. Por supuesto has viajado a mar. Apretaste las arenas entre tus dedos. Y olvidaste, por momento, todos miedos. Este aire es lo más agradable a respirar. El viento se eleva ligeramente tu pelo, mientras el sol te da una sonrisa para que tú quitas todo de tu prisa y tu espíritu disfruta el remodelo. Por supuesto, tendrás que salir. En el mar dejarás un poco de tu alma y guardarás los recuerdos para sonreír. Un mundo vasto te llena con calma y te regala tiempo para discutir lo que está tan consonante como tu poma. Tranquility. Of course you've traveled to the sea. You squished the sands beneath your toes, and you forgot for a moment all fears. This air is the most pleasant to breathe. The wind slightly lifts your hair, while the sun gives you a smile, so that you lose all your haste, and your, your spirit enjoys remodeling. Of course you will have to leave. In the sea, you will leave a little of your soul, and you will keep the memories to smile. A vast world fills you with calm, and it, keep, and it gives you time to discuss what is as constant as your poem. La pasión. ¿De dónde encuentras la pasión? ¿Te golpea como un camión? ¿O llegué lentamente con el tiempo? ¿De dónde aparecen las alas de tu alma? ¿O mejor, aún cómo viene el viento que te da vuelo? ¿De dónde cantan las canciones de tu corazón? ¿Y por qué a veces son susurrados, no gritados? ¿De dónde caen los copos de nieve? ¿Y cómo deciden a dónde aterrizar? ¿De dónde so se origina la curiosidad? ¿Y cómo te llenas con preguntas? ¿De dónde encuentras tu pasión? ¿Y cómo la usarás? Passion. Where do you find passion? Does it hit you like a truck? Or arrive slowly through time? Where do the wings of your soul appear? Or better yet, how does the wind that gives you flight come? Where do the songs of your heart sing? And why are they sometimes whispered, not cried? From where do the snowflakes fall? And how do they decide where to land? Where does curiosity originate? And how do you fill yourself with questions? Where do you find your passion? And how will you use it? Thank you. continuar con el grupo número 2 entonces uh, nosotros hemos preparado hemos preparado algo especial para ustedes eh, es un fanzine donde están todos los poemas donde pueden encontrar la información de los poetas y lo, lo vamos a estar pasando ok, so now we're going to start the second round of groups um, and before we do that we're going to start passing out the fanzines which has Um, the biographies of all of the poets and also the poems are also, and the short stories are also in there. And then, uh, para el grupo número dos, vamos a llamar entonces a Tatiana Dovnia de Ucrania, a Melissa Figueroa de Puerto Rico, Luis Enrique Mendoza de Perú. Entonces, vamos a empezar con Tatiana de Ucrania. We're gonna send it. Okay, so my poetry is in Russian, and I have two poems for you today. So first, I will read the Russian and then the English translation. Голодная ночь, ночь торжества и разочарования. Голодная повисла надо мной. Твоей жилистой нежной рукой застыла на плече, неловко и невнятно. Неразговорчивая бледная луна Вступиться не успела, не смогла. Лишь виновата, отстраненно Смотрела мимо нас, повнутрь меня. Не ощутили терпкость поцелуя, 
уюта смольной ночи не нашли. Лишь звонко следенящего пространства обняли холодно, простились и ушли. Неосязаемо тонкое присутствие, твой бледный зов, касание лица, беспомощной стальной руки, сжимающей меня, не прикасаясь кожи кожи, твои глубокие глаза, как Божий дар, торжественно принят. Я в ночь несу тебя. Hungered night. The night of triumph and blight, hollow, hung over me. Its sinew strong by gentle hand, froze on my shoulder, awkwardly and vaguely. Laconic moon, so pale afar, cried it did not, hung like a mar, with guilt aloofly. It looked past us and right inside me. That subtle quiet presence in the air, intangible and brusque, those helpless hands they didn't dare to move or sense, embrace or touch. The bitterness of bliss we failed to reach, or find the soothing comfort of twilight. Instead, we hugged the icy residence in space, deserted solemnly into the pitch black night. One is called Transcendence, but in Russian it's Переход. Заглядывая в паутину беспокойных снов, я вижу твою тень, склонившуюся надо мной, всегда спокойную и тихую, самую нежную, словно ангел. Я замираю. Это забытье и неподвижность, так чужды моей холерической натуре, моему непроходящему импульсу, нежнейшим образом мягко и незаметно прикоснуться к тебе. Перестаю дышать. Внутри я расправляю свои прозрачные руки, чтобы почувствовать твою кожу против моей, услышать твое дыхание, диссонирующее сердцебиение, чтобы удостовериться, что ты еще жив. Затихает пульс. Всепоглощающая память шуршания высокой травы тем летом, когда мы тонули в бездонном вечном синем небе, не отпускает меня. Не умерли ли мы тогда там, не имеет тела. Этот сон никогда не успокоится, несмотря на годы, океаны, жизнь, летаргию, смерть. Я знала тебя еще до, и я буду вновь греть тебя своими тонкими исчезающими руками уже совсем скоро, после Transcendence. Looking through the web of restless dreams, I see a shadow leaning over me, always still and calm, the most tender, like an angel. I lay still. My slumber and immobility strike me as unnatural to the choleric nature of my restless soul. To my constant impulse to touch you gently, I'm breathless. In my mind, I spread my transparent arms to feel your skin against mine, to sense your breath, to hear your dissonant heartbeat, to make sure you're still alive. My pulse is receding. The overpowering memory of the rustling of the tall grass that summer, as we gazed into the eternal blue sky, doesn't let me go. Did we die there? I turn numb. This dream will never subside. No matter the years, oceans, life, lethargy, death, I've known you before, and I will hold you in my hands again afterwards. Soon, I transcend. So good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Melissa Figueroa. I'm an assistant professor of Spanish here at IOU. And today I'm going to read a short story. So 
I sometimes occasionally wrote, write poetry, but today I'm going to focus on the short story. And this is a part of a collection that is going to be published this month um, by At the Poetica Press, a company um, based on New York. Um, one of the things that I always like to write about is my hometown. I'm from the I'm from, I'm from Puerto Rico, I'm from the East Coast, which is the most beautiful part of the island. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also the first, it's always the, the town that it always get hit by hurricanes. So there's always a lot, a lot of loss in that. So the short story that I'm gonna read is called Temporal, which is another word for storm or hurricane, no? And it's also like half the connotation, it, it, it evoked a famous song, no? Temporal, Temporal, by Damien and Temporal, no? So before that, I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, hurricanes. As you, as you know, hurricanes affect my islands. In 1928, we have Hurricane San Felipe, estimated damages 50 million. We have the in 1932. We have Hurricane Santa Clara, also known as Hurricane Betsy. This is in 1956. So I, I make a reference to this hurricane because that um, the hurricane that my father, um, he was small, a uh, small child when it happened. And I grew up hearing um, stories about Huracan Santa Clara. And Hurricane Hugo is the first hurricane that I experienced. Uh, it was awful. I was 10 years old. You can guess my, get, my age. Um, and then Hurricane George, which I already was in the university. And it was 1989. And as you know, Hurricane Maria, I, I don't even like there to talk about Hurricane Maria because I think that still um, there's a lot of trauma in that, especially in my hometown that I was like probably 95 percent destroyed. Um, it took 11 months to get home to the electricity. So as you can see, this is has been like a strong effect. But I also want to focus on you know, when you read about hurricanes and you know, dead and damages and people be crying. But also I want to say you, like, you to see hurricane as a cultural phenomenon. I mean, to be prepared for hurricane is a lot of fun because then you go to the supermarket, mm -hmm. you have to get ready because it's coming, <laughs> and you, you have to go and get Doritos. <laughs> beers. If you don't get beers, then you're not ready for a hurricane. <laughs> 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 Maybe if you want to get candles just in case, just in case, just good. Right? So, so this is part. Um, so I'm gonna read my. Uh, I'm gonna read my story in Spanish and then English. Temporal. Mi padre siempre nos contaba historias sobre Santa Clara. Yo no tengo derecho de cuestionar su memoria, pero siempre he sospechado que sus narraciones estaban contaminadas por los relatos populares y la imaginación infantil. Según el homicida, los vecinos se acomodaron en la única estructura que no era de paja mientras se escuchaban los estragos del viento. Se pusieron vasos llenos de agua al revés para que parara de llover y se hizo un rosario para enfocar la gracia de Dios. Se vieron casas, animales y plantas flotando por el agua gigantada de las quebradas. Todos celebraron la comunidad desde el encierro. Yo no quiero ser como mi padre, por eso pienso ir al supermercado a comprar cervezas, bolsas de doritos y las últimas velas para sentarme a esperar que pase el próximo huracán. Con las inundaciones, pienso quedarme solo en casa y dañar los muebles para que FEMA me ofrezca más dinero. Después de todo, hay que sacarle partido al trópico y empezar a contar que algunos de los cadáveres arrastrados por Santa Clara no murieron and the inspiration, I want to say thank you to Spencer. I really believe Spencer is a great translator. Um, I really believe that the English version sounds better than the English version, no? And that's, that's a beautiful um, work. So my father used to always tell us stories about Santa Clara. I don't have the right to question his memory, but I always suspected that his narrations were contaminated by popular tales and his childlike imagination. According to him, the neighbors settled down in the only structure that wasn't made of the hay. They spent hours there, sugar in, 
listening to the ravages of the wind. They place glass glasses filled with water upside down to make the rain stop and pray the rosary and invoke the grace of God. They saw entire homes, animals, and flats flow by the runaway water in the vines. The community celebrated. I don't want to be like my father, so I'm planning to go to the supermarket to buy beers, bags of Doritos, and the last of the candles to see wait out the next year again. And with the floods, I'm planning to stay at home alone and damage all the furniture so that FEMA will offer me more money. After all, you have to take advantage of the traffic and go around telling people. Hello, my name is Hannah Grace Morrison. I'm from Washington Courthouse, Ohio. I'm a recent graduate from Ohio University. I studied my master's in Spanish and Latin American literature. And um, I'm currently teaching in Ciudad Real in Spain. And I want to share today three poems in English um, with you all. I normally write in Spanish, Spanglish, or English, so I'm gonna share a couple in English with you today. I hope you enjoy them. Thank you. The first one is called, uh, Take Your Watch Off at the Door, Please. Put down the plastic bag, please, because I need you to have your hands free. Take off your shades, you're inside. This couch is trying to suck you in, and I need you to kick off your shoes, please, because the carpet is looking to tickle your feet. Take your watch off at the door, please. Time will be there when it's time to leave. So just take your watch off and blink the glaze out from your eyes, please. Please, hold me with your gaze, please. Hold me with your, please, hold me, please hold me. Take the keyboard from your palm and write the words on my skin, please. Shake the ground between your vocal cords until my name is between your teeth, until daydreams are filling up your cheeks, wrap me even in your speech. Please, look at my last painting. Tell me that's poetry. The colors write feelings. Tell me that you feel it, even if you hate to feel things. Please, taste my kiss to taste the colors that don't exist. But honestly, I can't speak for other galaxies. But here, it's you and me. So please, Stop looking at your wrist. You left your watch at the door. And I need a short, another short infinity to ask you what you think of the color green or of the color schemes of your dreams or if you can even sleep without me or if you can even dream without me. I know I can barely sleep unless you hold me. So I put my watch between the sheets because I heard that time doesn't sleep. And I wish time would dream to give me some peace to not worry about you or me, or when you tell me that you have to leave, hold me, please, because time never sleeps. The second one is today's tonight. Okay. Step into my office, where 3 p.m. haunts me like 3 a.m. because my click clack, click clack starts at eight o'clock sharp while the sun is taking its time with its soon-to-be goodbyes and came to quick hellos. The paranormal sightings are collecting in my head as I stare at the wall that sings. That song that I don't know how that I know, and I can't tell whether the lights are blinking or not. My uniform, click, clack, click, clack, with a skirt and makeup that takes up not just my cheeks. They put me up front for my smile, so they say, so each customer is greeted with grace. But really, I'm just the front face. The one that nods up and down to just about anything they say. Today, today's tonight. As I walk down the stone steps, I lift my hand into the indifferent sky, reaching the street corner, looking for a ride. All right. And the last one, which doesn't have a title, is number 32. <clears throat> Ain't no mountain high, ain't no valley low, ain't no river wide enough, baby. Please forgive me. It's hard to sing with my cheek against your chest 
that draws a line down to the rising hot water in this tub. My scratchy voice spills out, smelling of the sweet white wine that you've poured for us. The air fogs up like an early morning, and it's almost 2 a.m. here on your chest. If you need me, call me, no matter where you are, no matter how far, mm -hmm, baby. Sign sealed, delivered, I'm yours. Mm -hmm. Sugar pie, honey bun, you know that I love you. I can't help myself, I love you and nobody else. The lyrics line up and march through our tired, tingly bodies. And I'm singing because the room is lit like a Friday night and you're showing me a good time. The ringlets of ripples are ever so subtle, but as your arms look for the small of my back, giggles trickle into each note and our skin wrinkles up as if we were growing old together. Thank you. del desamor bancario en Chase Bank el amor es deliciosa marca, una extensión del crédito en plena nieve cuando eyacula la libertad del alma como pizzas industriales las putas pizzas y cuando van rodando las nuevas fotos llegan con tres heridas sobre la panza Qué delicia tu bien labrada panza Chase Bank es solución para tu marca y roleas las bien tomadas fotos como reventándote sobre la nieve cantan las sirenas yucas contra las pizzas ¿será que eliges lo correcto para tu alma? vendrá una ley seca para el alma en marzo las frutas crujen sobre tu panza siguiendo los deliveries de las pizzas como los designios del puto Dios marca ¿Qué hay de Chase Bank entre la nieve, amor, muerte y vida entre los fotos? Los celulares te proyectan como fotos. Chase Bank es solución para tu alma. Tres heridas blancas sobre la nieve. Pones clic sobre las ínfulas de panza. Las familias como amor, eslogan y marca. Cuánta felicidad comiendo pizza. Imagina cantar sextinas contra las pizzas y no compartir ninguna de tus fotos. La extensión del crédito expande tu marca. Usted es invitado gordo de nuestra alma. Extirparemos el desamor de su panza mientras las sirenas te fidelizan en plena nieve. Cuando las finanzas flotan sobre la nieve, empiezan las sextinas contra las pizzas para curar el desamor de tu vil panza la velocidad se enreda entre tus fotos y Chase Bank recibe los intereses de tu alma la extensión del crédito expande tu fucking marca <risa> y hacen tres heridas de marca sobre la nieve Chase Bank elimina las fotos de las pizzas habrás visto el desamor de un alma sin panza Now I'm gonna make, we're gonna do something worse. I'm gonna write the same poem in English. So. <laughs> <laughs> something worse. <laughs> A sextina of Viking indifference. Uh, I would like to say thank you to um, uh, the translation made by the Spencer Capelli again, please. <laughs> thank you. 
A chase van, love is a delicious brand, a great extension in the middle of the snow, when freedom of the soul ejaculates. Back in pizzas, like industrial parts, and I, when the new photos are rolling, you arrive with three woods on your belly. So delicious, your will cultivate belt. Chase Van is the solution for your brand, and you roll over the world taking photos. And it's bursting open up on the snow. The siren sings and the fame picks us. Will you choose what to write for your soul? A dry law will come for the soul. In March, the fruits crunch on your belly, following the deliveries of the pizzas, like the designs of the Goldman brand. What is there of chase man here on the snow? Love, death, and life, and the photos. The cell phone casts you like photos. Chase Van is the solution for your soul. Three white woods in the snow. You click yes on your belly's airs and rainbows. The family's love, slogan, and brand. How happy to be eating the pizza. Imagine singing Sextinas against the pixels and not sharing any of your photos. Credit extension expand your brand. You are the gold member of our souls. We will remove the indifference from your belly while the sirens optimize brand loyalty out in the snow. When finals float on the snow, the Sextinas start up against the pixels to heal the indifference of your real belly. Velocity gets mixed up in the photos, and Chase Bank recoups the interests of the soul. Credit extension extend your fucking brand. Three brands would lay up in the snow. Chase Bank eliminates the photos of the pixels. They must have seen the difference of your belly's soul. Thank you. Projection of my man, one uh, poem, but I'm just gonna make it in the Spanish version, which name is Capital. Um, it's not on the fan scene, but um, for some reason I wanted to, to, to share that with you. Um, Hay un largo viaje que emprende el agua desde el movimiento de las olas hasta la oficina de finanzas y una corriente submarina se desliza al interior del más curtido vertebral marchas bajo el agua marchas a 100 metros de la memoria de tus padres o sumerges en cada uno de tus sellos no todos, sino 10 la neblina borrosa de los charcos el guisado de la azotea los charcos sin gris y un polo que dice I love New York con realidad extrañas de cualquier otra ciudad y repites eu, pan, apa, nija, agua y en la orilla del lenguaje nuevamente herido porque no importa nada sobre el túnel directo al capital con esquinas y segundos desembrochándose a través del tiempo la prolactina de la infancia, el producto bruto interno, o las tetillas de un burócrata en una pizarra muerta. A 100 metros de tus padres, capital contra capital. A 100 metros de tus padres, capital contra capital. Y repites, eu, pani, apa, nija, agua y en la herida del lenguaje nuevamente herida porque no importa nada capital contra capital y descubres un olor hardcore vuelan pájaros heridos en la esquina de un pueblo para destruir todo el mundo gracias Hi, I'm Benny Lopez and I'm a Spanish grad student here at OU and I actually wrote this poem with my last spring semester of my undergrad here for a class and I added a little bit I'm going to present to you in Spanish and English. 
gritando para mi independencia de la sociedad que me silencia cuando opongo la estructura primitiva. Con la voz de un volcán resistiendo la representación de las mujeres en los medios que nos declaran menores, pero nos curamos la arena de su ruina, poseyendo la capacidad para transformar la loma en un dragón que destruye la desigualdad, combatiendo contra mi cosificación, en, para, pero ahora mi entidad se transfigura en un temblor, desmorando al patriarcado. Esta potencia existe en toda la mujer. Todas descubren esto para la reforma universal. For my independence from a society that silences me when I oppose the primitive structure. But the voice of a volcano resisting the representation of the women in the media is the declarance is less. But we crown ourselves the queen of their ruin, possessing the capacity to transform the norm in a dragon that destroys inequality. Fighting against my objectification, but now my entity transfigures into an earthquake, collapsing the patriarchy. This potential exists in every woman. All women discover this for universal reform. Thank you. Gracias a todos los presentadores y ahora vamos a tener un intermedio. Vamos a tener música y vamos a tener 15 minutos para eh, disfrutar la comida para que sigamos eh, comiendo y también el café colombiano. ¿Listo? Entonces para que oh, yeah. ah, sigan sí, no. So thank you very much everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the second group. Um, we're going to have like a little break, present, like uh, a break for 15 minutes. Uh, please help yourselves. No solamente somos un grupo, también queremos formar una familia. We're not only just a group, but we would like to form a family. Let's go. Está compuesto por Chico, con uh, Keith Perez, con Samira Iskenderova y con Carolina Sánchez González de Colombia, que es un video. Awesome. So I'm just going to give a little bit of background on uh, one of the pieces that I will be uh, performing. A friend of mine called Richard Hausa, he's a, a, paintist, a painter. Um, so he, I liked his artwork and thought I could use it to blend into my point, therefore giving it texture. And my piece is entitled Africa Under Siege. And uh, one of my best friends as well has also graciously agreed to give a musical accompaniment into that and Ariana to read uh, the Spanish uh, version for, for me. But if you like, I can read the Spanish version and she reads the English. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, that's the title of my poem, Africa Under Siege. Africa is raped. Africa is raped. Africa is raped. The continent of life is pumped dry and the colonizer won't stop till he stopped and blocked. We pay colonial tax for the baskets we have weaved our own weaved baskets. We remain cocooned to a mask. A philosopher who has seen Africa's image in the advent of adversity concludes, oh, the children of black skins, white masks, the despised and the despising living in the post-colonial but not yet decolonized. 
1885, you were chopped and divided by colonial borders, by colonial masters. Your rivers of knowledge were polluted, but they never ceased flowing. Your rainmakers pleaded to the ancestors for rain <coughs> that will cleanse the west of the west. A philosopher has paused and whistled. Oh, the rage of the earth. Now the wind of change is here. The new colonizer has already entered without even knocking, concluding without even asking. He is already in a feast and talking to the east. But still, the voices of your children are still daring and glaring. Voices from within. Voices comparable to water about to evaporate to the desert. In image and symbol. Neatly done, they look like a weaved basket or sometimes like a weaver bed that does not tire. Yet in rage and singing repeatedly an unending chorus of a dull song. They sing for you the land of fallen heroes. They cannot cease flowing. The river runs along the line of least resistance. The image of the new colonizer rejects your poets and griots when they cough syllables of tradition. When they plant a seed that should incite no fear for the dead, Africa is under siege, predated upon by vultures and dining with a fork and knife, and now chopsticks. We are silenced and crippled and ridiculed. All of a sudden, her tales are beliefs. Her tales and beliefs are witchcraft. Her decisions need to be validated. Her dream is deferred from the abundance of her production. Her labor, she receives only a grain of wheat or nothing. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Eh, vamos a continuar con, a leer su, su poema en español. con el poema en español. Con el poema en español. Con el poema en español. África bajo asedio. África es violada. África es violada. El continente de la vida es drenado hasta secarse y el colonizador no se detendrá hasta que lo detengan y sea bloqueado pagamos impuesto colonial por las canastas que hemos tejido nuestras propias canastas trenzadas nos mantenemos envueltos en una máscara concluye un filósofo que ha visto la imagen de África con la llegada de la adversidad concluye los hijos de pieles negras y máscaras blancas los menospreciados y los menospreciadores viviendo sin de descolonizarse la postcolonialidad. En 1885 fuiste cortado y dividido por fronteras coloniales, por amos coloniales. Tus ríos de conocimiento fueron contaminados, pero nunca dejaron de fluir. Tus hacedores de lluvia rogaron a los antepasados el aguacero que limpiará lo peor del oeste. Un filósofo ha hecho una pausa y ha silbado. Oh, los desdichados de la tierra. Ahora ha llegado el viento de cambio. El nuevo colonizador ha entrado, ya sin siquiera haber golpeado, sellando sin preguntar. Ya está en el festín llevándoselo para el este. Pero aún así, las voces de sus hijos aún son atrevidas y deslumbrantes. Voces desde dentro, 
voces comparables al agua a punto de evaporarse en un desierto, en imagen y símbolo. Bien hecho, se ven como una canasta tejida, o a veces como un pájaro tejedor que no se cansa. Pese a todo, cantando insistentemente, enrabiados en el coro eterno de una canción fastidiosa. Cantan para ti, sobre la tierra de héroes caídos, no pueden dejar de fluir. El río corre a lo largo de la línea de menor resistencia. La imagen del nuevo colonizador rechaza a tus poetas y cantores cuando tosen sílabas de la costumbre, cuando plantan una semilla que debería no incitar al miedo por los muertos. África está bajo asedio, rapiñada por rapaces, comiendo con cuchillo, tenedor y palitos chinos. Somos silenciados, lisiados, ridiculizados, de repente, sus leyendas son creencias, brujerías, sus decisiones son validadas. Su sueño es diferido. Por la abundancia de sus productos, por su trabajo, ella recibe solo un grano de trigo o nada. Y vamos a continuar con... Um... Spencer. Stop. So I'm going to read a poem that, if I can find it. I wrote this poem over the summer um, about the death of an individual, an individual that I felt like oddly near to, despite the fact that I never met him. Uh, his name was Anthony Bourdain. Um, he was a, a t he was the host on a TV show on a couple different channels. Um, and uh, he was just a really funny guy, someone that uh, I feel like exemplified some of the values that I feel like uh, we currently lack or are losing in this country that make us, um, that make it a nice place to live in. Uh, uh, so I wrote this poem for him. He was also one of the only people, I think, there was a tweet actually when he died that made me write this poem that said, uh, Anthony Bourdain was one of the only people that had a television show that inspired Americans not to be afraid of other people. And so I uh, wrote this poem to his legs. It's called An Elegy for Anthony Bourdain. <clears throat> Anthony, there is a bright sun rising and falling on either side of the ocean. But today in your absence, the impossible glow seems to have swollen slightly along its latitudes. The tongues of its people sound a little less intelligible amidst the bustle of cafes, and somewhere, in Seville or Montmartre, a man is putting out a lonely heat lamp that might have warmed travelers from across the bold Atlantic. Anthony, they say there was singing the day the music died, but not even Buddy Holly enjoyed this, the monologic intimacy of cable television. In living rooms all across America, there's a yawning hole where there was once your freewheeling curiosity, and the arms of young men and women that followed you somewhere new, somewhere different, are stiffer at their sides, unable to replicate your languid strut. Anthony, you said we lived the hell of our choosing, but you were plucked late in life from the lofty pages of the New Yorker, and I don't think it was an accident. And somewhere, the voice of Lou Reed is crooning at you through the radio, linger on, linger on. Anthony, what will become of us now? Neighbors afraid of their neighbors, and the nations all buttressing the Tower of Babel with plutonium. It's dark here now, but there is a bright sun rising in Hanoi, or Hong Kong, and the people of all the world with whom you indiscriminately share a table or a laugh are calling you home. Um, I'm going to read it in Spanish. I just wrote this translation this morning. Entonces, si hay un problema aquí con la traducción, que lo tomen con mi agente literario, que... <laughs> Elegía a Anthony Bourdain. Anthony, el sol brillante está subiendo y bajando por ambos lados del mar. Pero hoy en tu ausencia, el mundo imposible parece haberse crecido por sus latitudes. Las lenguas de la gente no se reconocen por el ruido de los cafés. Y en algún lugar, Sevilla, 
o Montmartre. Un hombre apaga una lámpara que quizás hubiera calentado a los viajeros de a través del Atlántico valiente. Anthony, se cantaba el día que murió la música, pero ni Barry Halley tenía todo esto. La intimidad monológica de la televisión. En salones por toda América ya existe un hueco amplio donde una vez había tu curiosidad desenfrenada y los brazos de sus seguidores ya se ponen rígidos. Nadie te sigue a un lugar desconocido. Anthony, dijiste que elegimos nuestro propio infier infierno en esta vida. Pero te agarraron desde las páginas prestigiosas de la New Yorker. Y no creo que haya sido accidente. Y por alguna radio lejana la voz de Lou Reed te está llamando. Linger on, linger on. Anthony. ¿Qué será de nosotros? Los vecinos temen el uno al otro y las naciones están poniéndole un lastre, un lastre de plutonio a la torre de Babel. El sol ya se ha puesto aquí, pero sube en Hanoi o en Hong Kong y la gente del mundo con quien compartiste una mesa o una carcajada está, están pidiendo que vuelvas a casa. de Ariela Carisi ella va a leer su es un cuento corto, lo va a leer en español y Sheila lo va a leer en inglés we're going to continue, thank you very much Spencer and uh, Ariela Carisi is going to read her uh, short story in Spanish and Sheila is going to read it in the English version gracias thank you Sandra yeah. este cuento se llama Chinatown Bass algunas gotas de lluvia tibia me caían por la nuca mientras intentaba concentrarme en esquivar a los insistentes vendedores ambulantes. Pero lo único en lo que podía pensar era en qué, en qué tan chamuscadas deberían estar las galletitas que me dio mi abuela adentro de la valija. Me había insistido tanto que no tuve el coraje de decirle que lo más probable era que me tiraran toda la comida en el aeropuerto. Después de 14 horas de vuelo más una escala de 8 horas en Santiago, lo normal sería cuando menos estar abatida. Pero el aire de Nueva York, además de 78% de nitrógeno y 21% de oxígeno, siempre parece tener un 1% extra de algo más que hace que a uno se le abran grandes los ojos y se le dilaten las fosas nasales. Como si respirara cafeína, mi cerebro estaba acelerado, casi tanto como la masa hormigueante y heterogénea de peatones que caminaban por el barrio chino. El ambiente estaba tan pesado y caliente que en lugar de estar caminando con una valija sentía que estaba nadando en sopa caliente arrastrando un cuerpo inerte. Las calles se empezaban a dibujar familiares en mi memoria y supe que me estaba aproximando a la oficina desde donde debería tomar el autobús. Me acordaba que en el vidrio sucio tenían unas letras rojas gigantes y de mal gusto. Por lo tanto, no fue difícil identificar el negocio en medio de los almacenes y las tiendas callejeras de una calle en la que el suelo no se veía de tanto polvo y suciedad. Adentro del local tenían algunas sillas y un baño pequeño en el que siempre había fila. Algunas personas esperaban igual que yo la salida del autobús, cada uno con sus paquetes y valijas gigantes. Había personas de todos tamaños y de todos los colores, Escuché al menos cinco idiomas diferentes Pero todos tenían en los ojos la mirada del que viaja para llegar a casa Me senté en una silla al lado de un pequeño cajero automático que había Y me saqué el saco porque me estaba muriendo de calor Entonces noté que un chico de ojos grandes sentado enfrente me estaba mirando Y no me gustó la forma Nerviosa me miré la camisa y de manera inconsciente me abroché el último botón, como si un centímetro más de tela me protegiera de algo. Volví a mirar la fila de personas que esperaba para ir al baño, en su mayoría mujeres con vestidos extravagantes. Pero en ese momento entró desde la calle un chico con camiseta blanca y chaqueta de cuero, lentes de aviador y una coleta larga en la espalda. Así, casi como salido de una película. Las ganas de escribirle un cuento se me fueron cuando se puso en la fila del baño. Demasiado mundano. 
Mis ojos se fueron otra vez para adelante y otra vez el chico de ojos saltones me estaba mirando, sin disimulo. No le quise sostener la mirada por miedo a que lo tome como una invitación. Así que me concentré en una mujer que estaba sentada a mi derecha con un atuendo africano típico. Tenía un vestido y un pañuelo en la cabeza del mismo estampado. Entonces me concentré en el estampado. Era de color celeste y amarillo, muy brillante. Tenía como pequeñas sogas entrelazadas unas con otras. Pensé que me gustaba, quizás, por el contraste de los colores con su piel. Viajaba con mucho equipaje, unas cuantas bolsas y un bolso pequeño debajo de su brazo. Pero lo que más me llamó la atención fue un costal gigante de color blanco que reposaba a sus pies. La puerta se cerraba y se abría constantemente y fue en ese momento cuando entró el tercer personaje. Un señor alto, altísimo, con un traje que parecía de diseñador. Su traje no era liso ni negro, era gris con pequeños rayitos negros. Los mejores asientos. Lejos del baño trasero que apestaba orín durante las ocho horas de viaje, aun cuando el autobús apenas empezaba su recorrido. El chico de ojos saltones caminó detrás de mí, muy cerca, casi lo sentía respirarme en la nuca. En la vereda encontré a dos personas hablando mi idioma, y pensé qué curioso que a veces lo único que uno necesita para sentirse menos solo es escuchar dos palabras en la lengua madre. El autobús llegó y varias familias chinas abalanzaron sobre él para empezar a cargar sus equipajes. No solo tenían maletas, sino que todo tipo de bultos, bolsas, frazadas. Había tres compartimientos para equipajes, cada uno con el nombre de una ciudad distinta. El mío era el primero. Y apenas habían pasado 30 segundos de la llegada del autobús, pero ya estaba casi lleno. Las maletas estaban desorganizadas. Se estaba desperdiciando mucho espacio. Intenté decirle en inglés a los señores chinos que acomodaran sus cosas, pero ni siquiera me miraron. Atrás mío, la señora de Senegal daba órdenes a los que supuse serían sus hijos que cargaban sus cosas. Y el señor ruso miraba su reloj nervioso mientras que con su otra mano llena de anillos sostenía una elegante y pequeña maleta negra. A este paso, todas mis cosas iban a quedar afuera y me iba a tocar el peor asiento del autobús, que ya estaba medio lleno. Mi valija pesaba 32 kilos y para subirla al, comp al compartimiento del autobús me quedé sin aire. Estaba casi adentro, pero no entraba del todo. Entonces, sin pensarlo mucho, me adentré gateando y arrastrándome por arriba de los bultos de los otros. Empecé a mover los equipajes de manera frenética, empujándolos contra las paredes del autobús. Intenté olvidarme de mi claustrofobia por un segundo para poder cumplir la misión de que mi valija pueda venir conmigo a casa también. El señor ruso que se había agachado y se había asomado al compartimiento, todavía con su valija en la mano, me daba ánimos. You got this, girl. Lo logré. Mi valija estaba adentro. Ahora solo restaba salir de adentro del compartimiento y encontrar un buen asiento. Me puse de espaldas para salir gateando, pero unas manos me empujaron desde afuera hacia adentro. Y en ese momento, pánico. Hey, I'm still here. Las manos siguieron empujando y empecé a sentir bultos y pesos muertos por arriba de mis piernas. Empecé a revolverme con desesperación. Intenté salir otra vez, pero no venía nada por encima del mar de valijas y bultos y bolsas que había flotando a mi alrededor. Entonces, parcialmente, el compartimiento se oscureció y sentí cómo cerraron la puerta automática. En vano intenté seguir gritando. No me escuchaban, no me querían escuchar. No importa el idioma que usara. En el medio de la oscuridad pude mover un brazo que se encontró con un bulto, liso, blanco y uniforme. Me resigné a que el costal de 32 kilos de azúcar iba a ser mi compañero durante estas 8 horas de viaje. Y para ser sincera, lo preferí antes que al chico de ojos saltones. Gracias. Chinatown bus. A few drops of warm rain were running down the back of my neck as I tried to concentrate on avoiding the insistent street vendors. 
but the only thing I could think about was how smashed the cookies my grandmother gave me were going to be inside of my suitcase. She had insisted so much that I did not have the courage to tell her that it was probable that they would throw out all the food at the airport. After 14 hours of flying, plus an eight hour stopover in Santiago, it would be normal, at least, to be exhausted. But the air of New York, besides 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen, always seems to have an extra 1% of something else that makes one's eyes open wide and dilates the nostrils. As if I were breathing caffeine, my brain was accelerated almost as much as the throng of swarming and heterogeneous pedestrians walking through Chinatown. The atmosphere was so heavy and hot that instead of walking with the suitcase, I thought I was swimming in hot soup, dragging an inert body. The streets began to look familiar, and I knew that I was approaching the office from where I had to take the bus. I remembered that in the dirty glass, they had giant red letters, which were a bad taste. Therefore, it was not difficult to identify it amongst all the stores and street shops, especially because the street was covered in so much dust and dirt. Inside the office, they had some chairs and a small bathroom in the back where people were always lined up. Some people were waiting, as I did, for the departure of the bus, each of them, with their giant packages and suitcases. There were people of all sizes and of all colors. I heard at least five different languages, but everyone had in their eyes the look of the one who travels to get home. I sat in a chair next to the small ATM that was there and I took off my jacket because I was suffocating. Then I noticed that big eyed boy sitting across from me, staring. And it was not a friendly, innocent glance. Nervously, I looked at my shirt and unconsciously, I fastened the last button as if one more centimeter of fabric would protect me from something. I looked back at the line of people waiting to go to the bathroom. Most women in extravagant dresses, but at that moment, a boy in a white shirt and leather jacket entered from the street. Aviator lenses and a long ponytail on the back of his head. Yes, almost like he'd come out of a movie. The desire to write a story about him abandoned me when he got in the line, when he got in line in the bathroom. Too mundane. My eyes went through the entire place once more, and again the bulging eyed boy was staring at me with no dissimulation. I did not want to hold his gaze, for I was afraid of him taking my looking back at him as an invitation. So I focused on a woman sitting on my right in a typical African outfit. She had a dress and matching headscarf. Then I concentrated on the pattern of the fabric. <coughs> it was of a very bright blue and yellow color with little ropes intertwined with each other. I thought I liked it, maybe because of the contrast of colors with their skin. She was traveling with a lot of luggage, a few bags and a small bag under her arm. But what caught my attention was a giant white sack resting on her foot. The door opened and closed constantly. And it was at that moment when the third character entered, a tall man, very tall, with a suit that looked like it was from a famous designer. His suit was not smooth or black, it was gray, with small thunderbolts. Can you imagine this pattern that I'm describing? Imagine a gray background full of small and infinite thunderbolts side by side, symmetrically. It would be something we're seeing on a catwalk. The man had a gold watch and a few rings, elegant, thin, and white hands. He was wearing a pair of square red glasses and the tip of his nose was very bright. He immediately went to sit next to the African lady, and he did not wait even 10 seconds before he started talking to her. He spoke in English, although his pronunciation was very accurate, you could tell that he was not native. The color of his voice was very particular. I'd already heard a voice like that somewhere else. The vowels were musical and toned clear. The consonants articulated perfectly without apparent effort. Surely he was Russian. The lady's English was a little bit, was a bit rustier, but there was something solemn in her eyes when she nodded. They were talking about the white sack. The man pointed it out to her, asking her, sugar? The woman nodded and said, Senegal. 
I paid more attention to the sack and saw that it had some letters. Words, perhaps? Yes, yes, they were words. And they were in my language. The sack said, 32 kilos of sugar, product imported from Guatemala. The bus was arriving in 20 minutes, but people started to stand up and move their things out. I was mentally prepared to go through that euphoric moment where all the passengers would be brutally pushing and hurrying to leave their luggage inside the bus and climb to grab the best seats. Away from the rear bathroom, that stank of urine during the eight hours of travel, even when the bus was just beginning its journey. The bulging-eyed boy walked behind me very closely. I could almost feel him breathing on the back of my neck. On the sidewalk, I met two people speaking my language, and I thought it was curious that sometimes the only thing you need to feel less lonely is to hear two words in your mother tongue. The bus arrived and several Chinese families pounced on it to start loading their luggage. Not only did they have their suitcases, but all kinds of packages, bags, blankets. There were three compartments for luggage, each with the name of a different city. Mine was the first one, and even though 30 seconds had passed since the bus arrived, it was almost already full. The suitcases were disorganized. A lot of space was being wasted. I tried to tell the Chinese gentleman in English how to accommodate all their luggage, but they did not even look at me. Behind me, Madame Senegal gave orders to those who I assumed were her children. They were carrying her things, and Mr. Russian looked at his watch nervously, while, his, while with his other hand, full of rings, he had an elegant and small black suitcase. At this moment, all my things were going to be left behind and I was going to get the bus's worst seat, which was already half full. My suitcase weighed 32 kilos. And just by trying to lift it, I was out of breath. It was almost inside the compartment, but it did not all fit. Then without thinking much, I crawled and crawled over the bags of others. I started to move the luggage frantically, pushing everything against the walls of the bus. I tried to forget about my claustrophobia for a second so I could fulfill my mission. My suitcase needed to come home with me as well. The Russian gentleman who had crouched down and leaned into the compartment, still with his suitcase in his hand, cheered me up. You got this girl, he said. I made it. My bag was inside. Now I only had to get out of the compartment and find a good seat. I got on my hands to crawl, but other hands pushed me back in from the outside. And in that moment, panic. Hey, I'm still here. The Can hands kept pushing, and I began to feel lumps and dead weights above my legs. I began to stir with despair and tried to leave again, but nothing came over the sea of suitcases that were floating around me. Then gradually, the compartment got dark, and I heard them close the automatic door. In vain, I tried to scream, but they did not listen to me. They did not want to listen to me. It did not matter what language I used. In the middle of the darkness, I was able to move an arm and came across a lump, smooth, white uniform. It was pointless fighting. I resigned myself to the fact that the 32 kilogram sack of sugar was going to be my companion during those eight hours of travel. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias. Vamos a continuar con un video de Carolina Sánchez González. Ella es colombiana y nos nos envió un video para que podamos escuchar su poesía. Hola, mi nombre es Carolina Sánchez y voy a leerles dos de mis poemas. Genealogía. Presiento el pájaro vestido de negro era mi abuela, llegando a tierras lejanas donde la soledad era una forma de vida. Presiento a mi abuela pájaro aterrizar en este páramo, huérfana, extranjera, de silencio filoso, la posición rígida bajo el cuello isabelino, austera como una casa de protestantes en el campo aséptica y cruel. Mi abuela comprendió pronto, no podía hablar, no podía pensar, no podía. 
cumplió su sentencia, sabía, lo único permitido era morir. El pájaro de mal agüero, que era mi abuela, sigue viendo el mundo con espanto a través de mis ojos. Siete cueros. Árbol de huesos largos, piel papel de mantequilla, que no se esfuerza por crecer fuerte, sino solo transparente, para que el corazón del árbol vea la luz, se esfuerza por hacerse otro, pero con la misma piel frágil, mudar las veces que sea necesario. Eh, y vamos a continuar con el grupo número 4. Tenemos eh, un grupo muy especial de Rusia. Entonces, vienen con nosotros. Libia Kanishenka, Samira Eskenderva, Kristan, Kleandrie, Abigail Robinson, Nila Shuchenka y Chloe Bethel. ¿Cómo? No. Y tiene la etapa a mi niña, 
Agni Kakneti Zalatvi Bus, National Ballistica Vartu Gus, Aspaveditia Ad Dnevne Us, Drizia Panitia Shayaban Snus. Here's the translation. Uh, in my enormous city at night, I left my home far out of my sight to guess a wife, a daughter they might, but I remember just one thing, night. The summer wind would sweep my path clean, some distant music can't quite stay in. Ah, winds to blow until the sun's seen, into my chest and through my thin skin. A window's light and elm's color done, and bells were sound and hands still keep sun. My steps, these ones, are after no one. My shade, this one, is here, but I'm gone. The lights like told that tiny golden threads gleam, a taste of puddles in the night's dim, and do the daytime smothering seem, and friends accept that I'm your dream. Мне нравится, что вы были не мной. Мне нравится, что я был на Ливане. Что никогда тяжелый шар за мной не уплывет под нашими ногами. Мне нравится, что можно быть смешной, распущенной. И не играть словами. И не краснет удушливой волной, слегка соприкоснувшись Руковами. Мне нравится еще, что вы при мне спокойно обнимаете другую. Не прочите мне в одном огне гореть за то, что я не вас целую. Что имя нежное мое, мой нежный, не упоминаете ни днем, ни ночью суе. Что никогда сер церковной тишине не пропают над нами. Аллилуйя! Спасибо вам и сердцем и рукой за то, что вы меня не зная сами, так любите за мой ночной покой, за редкость встреч с закатными часами, за наши негояния под луной, за солнце не у нас над головами, за то, что вы болны, уви, не мной. За то, что я болна, уви, не вам. And the translation is, I love how you are not in love with me. I love how I am not in love with you. How never will the heavy sphere of the earth fade away from us, from both you and me. I love how laughable I am with you, how carefree, not struggling over every word not blushing in a suffocating wave when our sleeves accidentally brush. I also love how in my presence you freely embrace another and how you do not wish me to burn for not kissing you on fire. That my sweet name, O oh my beloved, you neither say through days nor nights, O oh never, that never in the silence of the church will they sing over us, Alleluia. Thank you from the very bottom of my heart for all your love for me without yet knowing and for the peace of mind I have at night, the rareness of our dates at sunset, the moonlight walks that we shall never take, the sun that never shines down on us at once. For you, alas, are not in love with me, for I, alas, am not in love with you. I think we'll read the poet who wrote a lot about the Second World War and and the translation it is I was in love with your laughter, I was in love with your voice, and your heart was what I wanted the most. But the heart stayed aloof and afar, rust of years has made a scar. Love insisted the rust will yield, love believed in its mighty shield. Rust forever remained there glued, heart stayed cold and never subdued. Dr. Sovchenko will talk a couple of words <coughs> about why I'm reading um, um, in Bulgaria, not in Russian. 
And uh, first of all, I'm not a poet, <laughs> but I am a poet in my soul, <laughs> in my heart, <laughs> when I write about drama, and I'm a poet in my classroom. And these guys can attest to it. <laughs> Uh, why Bulgarian? Because um, I was um, born and raised in a bilingual and bicultural family. My father uh, being Russian and my mother being Bulgarian. Since all of these guys uh, did a great job, and uh, also Tatiana, uh, Miss Dovnia, uh, did a great job representing Russian um, poetry, and poetry written in Russian, I'm impressed, Tanya. I'm shocked. You're a talent. <laughs> She's a talent. Um, uh, I will uh, read some, since we have time a little bit, and the poem I'm going to, uh, to read is very short. That's why I will have, uh, I will take the liberty to tell you more, a little bit more why this poet, uh, I chose him, Dimitri de Belanov, um, a beloved um, Bulgarian <coughs> poet who died very young um, at, uh, during the First World War. Um, He's one of those iconic poets uh, who's uh, he didn't uh, leave a lot, of, um, you know, uh, a lot of uh, political um, heritage. But um, he um, he was exactly just at the beginning of his career. He was uh, born in a small but very beautiful town in uh, in the mountains, Kuprivstica, uh, to a um, prosperous <coughs> family. But his uh, father died, and then he. The Julian had to move his family uh, first to Plovdiv, which is a big city in central Bulgaria, and then to Sofia, uh, the capital. And then they uh, kind of uh, uh, were uh, the family was struggling. So he uh, began uh, writing and sending his poetry in 1906 uh, to Bulgarian literary magazines. And he was uh, encouraged immediately by the, um, one of the uh, biggest names in Bulgarian um, modernism, Pencho Slaveikov, one of the uh, Bulgarian poets who was um, nominated for Nobel Prize in literature. <coughs> uh, he um, wasn't able to find uh, employment uh, very often, and he was moving from job to job. Uh, and uh, uh, he worked uh, a little bit as a junior clerk at a meteorological station. You can guess that he wasn't very happy there. Then he enlisted in the first, uh, not in the first, but before that he um, enlisted, uh, was enlisted, drafted in the Balkan Wars. Uh, and he survived that. Then he returned um, and uh, started working uh, in the post office, but then he was so unhappy again with this modern job, so he enlisted again, and then he was killed uh, at the front in 1916. So most of his um, um, poetic heritage was uh, uh, collected and published by his friends and uh, uh, by his uh, literary fellow, fellow, fellows, poets fellows, um, posthumously, and um, you can uh, say that he belongs to the Bulgarian Symbolist Movement. Movement, you will see from the, the uh, poem I'm going to read that it's a lot about, um, it's uh, actually playing upon uh, one of the most uh, um, employed uh, trope, the trope of uh, of home uh, versus jail, enclosed versus outer space, uh, and a couple of other bina binary oppositions, uh, and the motif of um, uh, the quest for the sacred space. The um, poem was written in 1914, two years before, prior to his death. Помнишь ли, помнишь ли тихий двор, тихий дом, были цветники вишни? Ах, не проблясвайте в мой затвор, жалби далечни, вспомни вишни. А сам заключен и помрачен затвор, жалби далечни, вспомни вишни. Моята стража и моя позор, 
моля да казвам съдните предишни. Помниш ли, помниш ти в тихия двор, шъпоте смях да отседните вишни, ах не пробуждайте светлия хор, хорът на ангеливните предишни, ах съм заключени в мрачен затвор, жалби далечни и спомени лишни. Сън е бил, сън е бил тихия двор, сън са били белоцветните вишни. It's a beautiful dactyl, I believe. Uh, this world's like a um, rhythm. Now, uh, the English uh, translation done by Christopher Buxton. Remember, remember the quiet yard, the quiet home in the wild blossom cherries. Oh, don't shimmer through my dark prison bars. Calls from afar and banquet memories. I'm a jailbird in a dark prison place. Abuse from afar and memories outcast. The only guard is my own disgrace. My sentence is served in all days long past. Remember, remember in the quiet yard, midst the blooming white cherries, whispers and laughter. Ah, don't awake the sacred choir, the angel's choir of the past sought after. I'm the jailbird in dark prison bar, appeals from afar and bankrupt memories. It was a dream, it was a dream, the quiet yard was a dream, the wild, blooming chairs. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias. So, I think this is the end. Um, oh, thank you for the amazing. I want, to say, <laughs> I want to say some <laughs> words. I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank the Russian poetry, the Russian literature. I think it's a great, great combination and great idea that you are here. Uh, where I feel, and I think we all feel very honored to have you here and to hear these beautiful languages. That is, they are different, very different from the ones that we are used to, but they really enrich our imagination and our sounds too. So I really, I'm really grateful and, and thank you all for being here and for sharing this moment of poetry with us, with our families. And yeah. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you.